Well, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Dynamic Life. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for those who are here live and those who are tuning in by our Facebook Live page. We really appreciate that you've taken the time to stop by and hear a word from the Lord. And we pray that we will not disappoint you in that matter. But we're going to continue our study in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. Uh, you have your Bible turn to John 17 first. Uh, John 17 is very important in the exposition and understanding what Paul is driving at in Ephesians chapter 4, as well as chapter 2, verse 11 through 33 is important. But we want to start with the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ in John 17, specifically with verses 20 and following. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles, we'll read for context, and then we'll jump over to Ephesians. John 17, starting with verse 20. Jesus prays, I do not pray for those these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he prayed previously for himself. He then prayed for the apostles. But he's also praying for those that the apostles will share the gospel with, and that all Christians will hear the gospel, the same gospel, that he taught to the apostles will be taught to those who come along after them and will be handed down the line. So he's praying for all of us. Uh, basically, just think of it, he's praying for all those who will be included in the church age and to the rapture. So that's really the context of this prayer. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. So highlight that. The prayer is that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. So you have unity and diversity right there. One, but one in us or one like us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit is reflecting on the Trinity as he prays his prayer. That the world, those who do not believe, may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, there again we see the word, just as we are one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. One God we built in three persons and different functions. I am them, you and me, verse 23, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Now, I won't belabor the point because we have taught on this section already in previous times on Wednesday night, and you have heard it sonically on Sunday mornings, uh, but we need to understand that the importance of the world seeing the oneness of the body of Christ, the church, helps make evangelism that much more effective. It undergirds our witness. So you can now understand why the enemy would be so serious and so intent on keeping us divided because it's by the oneness that the unbelievers will believe that the Father sent the Son. Amen. So we have to understand and we refuse to understand and we're not understanding because we're not looking from a theological per, uh, perspective. We're looking from a historical perspective. We're looking from an American perspective. We're not looking from a kingdom perspective or a global perspective. Satan wants to do everything to hinder the oneness. Because the more effective we are at being one, the more effective our witness will be to unbelievers. Are y'all are getting that? Mm -hmm. And Jesus prays this. And I don't know a prayer in the Bible that Jesus prays that don't get done. Mm -hmm. I don't think Jesus prays for things that he's not serious about. I don't think Jesus prays for things that are not in line with the Father's will. So if Jesus prays his prayer, and he's praying for all of us who are yet to come after the apostles, shared the word with other people, and then they shared the word with other people, and the word has been shared from generation to generation and down through history, this prayer is still valid. But what we have refused to understand as churches and not only as churches, when it comes to the political arena, when it comes to the social arena, when it comes to the psychological arena, whatever arena, when it comes to marriages, we have forgotten the power of oneness, the importance of oneness. 
And the importance is it, it helps us to be more effective in our evangelism, in our outreach. It helps the unbeliever to believe our message when they see the oneness among God's people. They will believe, Jesus says, that you have sent me when they see the oneness of those who are yet to be born again. Those who have yet to hear the gospel. So this is a prayer that is valid down through history until the church is raptured because he's praying really looking forward about the church without even missing, mentioning the church in the context. Because we know the church will soon be what? brought into existence not long after this prayer. Not long after his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The day of Pentecost will happen and the Holy Spirit will come and the Holy Spirit will take all the people who were Jews and proselyte Gentiles who had come together for the day of Pentecost, all the people from the then known regions of the world of different ethnic groups and different languages, and they will all speak in one language and hear one language. But yet Satan has done a great job of keeping us segregated. Amen. Not only in church, but in our marriages. Not only in our marriages, but in our school system. Not only in our school system, but in the political arena. But yet we have people in Washington. We have people in the educational system. We have people in the economic system. We have people in our neighborhoods and in our churches who claim to be Christians but are divided over silly stuff, over temporary things, and we have all this eternal in common. Something is wrong. Now, one of the things that's wrong is everybody professing ain't possessing. But even among those who are truly possessing, we're not seeing enough of this. And I'm not just talking about the church, because I think we have this confused understanding of church. This affects every arena that we as Christians live in. We are people of the kingdom. This is for kingdom people. These are people who claim the lordship of Jesus Christ over their life. Now, we want to claim the lordship of Christ. And then dilly-dally, reflecting the Lordship of Christ. Have all kinds of excuses and unbiblical rationale. And yes, none of us are perfect and none of us do this perfectly, but is there enough evidence to say you're guilty of being one who possesses the Lordship of Christ? And one of the ways we reflect that, and one of the most important ways we reflect that, is by reflecting oneness among his people. We cannot be one with people who are Satan's people. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13 and following, we've done a lesson on that. There's a reason we're doing all these lessons on Wednesday night. Because I don't think we're getting it. I think somewhere along the line, Satan got in the mix and has poisoned the water, and we've been drinking the water. Because he mixed in some Kool-Aid and some sugar and some artificial sweetness for those of you who are healthy. Notes. But it's still dangerous. And so we've been talking in Ephesians, if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and you know we've already done a lesson on Ephesians chapter 2, for those who are here, about the oneness. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. I'm just reading to review to bring us up to chapter 4. Because it all connects, it all goes together. John 17 is a preview of Ephesians chapter 2. And chapter 4 wants to say that if you've heard the prayer and you've had the reality of chapter 2, here's what you ought to look like in your practice and how you live it out. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that you once, that you once, Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. That's the definition of a sinner. A sinner is someone who is without Christ. So you can be a moral person 
and be a sinner because you are without Christ. There are no truly good people. Romans chapter 3 talks about that. There is none good, no, not one. Okay? But this is a definition of a sinner if you need a definition. That at that time you were out Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise. Alienated, separated from God. Separated from the promises and the covenant and the inheritance of God. Having no hope. Did you get that? Having no hope. But everybody's got a little bit of good in them, but everybody has no hope. There is no hope of you ever pleasing God apart from Jesus Christ. There is no hope of you ever becoming connected with God, in unity with God, because you're alienated from God. You have no hope outside of Christ. None. Zero. But yet today we have churches giving people false hope. What I call hope no. Because we don't believe the Bible anymore. And we don't like to hurt people's feelings. I've been listening to a series by John MacArthur that he's teaching. If you haven't listened to it, you should go listen to it. And, 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 and he was, in the series, he basically titled it, and Sister Cup has the book, and it has a different title, Jesus Unleashed. But in uh, Dr. MacArthur's uh, exposition he's doing on the radio, he talks about how to talk to heretics. And he uses Jesus' illustration or, or the story of him cleansing the temple. Listen to this. Jesus did not come and attack Rome. Jesus did not come and attack the political system. Jesus did not come and attack society. But Jesus went and tore up the religious system there was a false system of hope. Because they were making a mockery of his father's house. And John says, if Jesus came back right now, he would not attack the politics. He would not attack the Democrats or Republicans. He would attack the church. Because God's house has become a den of thieves. And thieves, back in biblical times, head out in caves. And this is what he's saying about the temple. So I'm on good foundation when I tell you all the problem is not the world, the problem is the church. It was the problem in Jesus' time, it's the problem today. If you read Ephesians, if you read Revelation chapter 2 and 3, who is he addressing? Why do we not get that? The Bible says itself, judgment must begin in the household of God. But yet God's people think they're safe, no matter how they live and what they're practicing. Listen to this. You have no hope without God in the world, in this life. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. This is why we're preaching on Sunday through Colossians, the preeminence of Christ. Your only hope is Christ. Amen. But your only hope is a right understanding of Christ. Amen. By recognizing his preeminent position and living like he's preeminent. To not live like Christ is preeminent is to live based on a false Christ. <clears throat> Let me say it one more time for good measure. To live like Christ is not preeminent and does not have the right, the first priority in every of your life is to live based on a false Christ. This is why Paul was so adamant when he spoke to the Galatians that they were, he was, he was so, he was upset. They were being so soon moved away from the gospel that he had preached about Christ to another gospel of a different time. And whoever was teaching that, he gave a strong condemnation to. Let him be damned to hell. That's what it means, Anathema. That's what it means. Let him be damned to hell. That's how serious it is. 
Because if people are believing in a false gospel, they're already damned to hell, and they will continue to be damned to hell, believing a false gospel about a false Christ. But yet, Sunday after Sunday, you can go to church after church, and there is no Christ being preached. There is no Christ being exalted in the songs that are sung. Man is being exalted. <laughs> Titles that talk about what Jesus can do for you, but about, not, about, not about who he is. And so we all love what he can do for us because we all like spiritual welfare programs, <laughs> spiritual affirmative action programs where we get something for nothing. Or we get something because we think we're victims and we deserve a leg up. Everybody was born separate from God. Everybody was born outside the commonwealth of Israel and the promises of God. Everybody was born with no hope in this world. Therefore, everybody needs to come to Christ Jesus because you once were far off but now you have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He has made peace between God and man and man and God. But Paul's going to build on that and says not only he's made peace between God and man and man and God, he's made peace between Jew and Gentile. Free and slave. Barbarian and Cynthia. Male and female. But in most marriages that claim to be Christian marriages, there are war zones in their houses. Where's that peace at? Churches fussing and fighting with each other. Where's the peace at? Who has made both one? Did I tell you this is not where the prayer gets, gets fulfilled? And has broken down the little wall of separation. Whatever was separating us before from God and from one another, Jesus tore it all down. Yet we spend all our time rebuilding walls. Hmm. Having abolished in his flesh, meaning his death on the cross, the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create himself one new man. Are we getting this one thing yet? From the two. Who's the two? Jew and Gentile. Black and white. Ku Klux Klan and Black Panther members. Bloods and Crips. <laughs> Put whatever you want in there, but Jesus has solved that if you have come to Jesus by faith. <clears throat> and he's torn down all the walls. What are you doing putting them back up? And that he might reconcile them both to God. See, you can solve any problem if y'all would just meet up in God. When I do marriage counseling, I let people talk for a little while just to find out where they are. But if I can get them both to meet up in God, stop trying to meet each other. We can solve a lot of stuff real quick. If I can't get at least one to meet up in God, we're not getting very far. And I've just learned to dismiss the counseling session because you can't get anywhere until people are really to meet up in God. And that he might respect out them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. That's really the key of this passage, putting to death the enmity. Whatever the enmity has been between God and man and between Jew and Gentile, he has put it to death by his death on the cross. And he has secured it by his resurrection from the dead. Mm -hmm. And he has maintained it by sending the Holy Spirit. And he watches over it by being our intercessor who sits at the right hand of the Father. We got all that, we still can't get it together. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So 
Paul is taking all this and he's bringing us to chapter 4 and he's saying that we don't try to get unity, we're trying to preserve the unity we have. That's why you don't go to unity meetings. Because they're trying to figure out how we can be unified when Jesus said, I have already unified those who are in me and I am in them. Amen. Now preserve that unity. See, our role is to preserve the unity we already have. Why? Because we were separated before Christ. We were alienated before Christ. We had walls up between us and God and between one another when we were outside of Christ. But now that we're in Christ, the walls have come down. We have access to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We have Christ indwelling us through the person of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit filling us to enable us, to empower us, to equip us to pull off what we can't pull off in our flesh. And we're still trying to figure out how to get it done. So that brings us to where we've started. And let me catch some of you up because you haven't been here or you might be listening new tonight. There are three unifying principles all Christians and churches must follow and model based on what we're finding in Ephesians chapter 4, 1 through 6. We spent our first lesson talking about the priority of the model of unity through the church. Look at verse 1. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord. And we talked about what that means and the power of that. Beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Walk like you've been called. Walk like you were elected and saved to walk. That word calling is a word for election, for salvation. Don't walk like you walked before you were called. Walk like you've been called to walk now that you've been called, that now that you've been saved, now that you've been chosen, now that you've been elected. And the walks don't look the same. I didn't say what y'all thinking. Y'all thinking they shouldn't look the same. No, they don't look the same. They do not look the same. Not based on everything I described to you that you have now in Christ and you didn't have when you were outside of Christ. How can the walks look the same? How can you be walking like Christ, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, and you look like you walk when you didn't have Christ? How did you not have the ability to keep his commandments and love him, but now that you are saved, you now have the ability to keep his commandments and love him, and you still walk like you don't love him and can't keep his commandments? The pastor Clay, you don't understand. We're only human. That means you are saved. Because now you're a supernatural human. You have all of heaven available to you. Well, I can work this for you. Yeah, really really good. Good. Do you know that you have all of heaven available to you now as a Christian? Do you know you have angels that guard you, protect you, and that when you die will usher you into the presence of God? Do you now not know that you have the Holy Spirit residing in you and that he can rule you and reign in you? You are not anything like what you were before. You have the body of Christ who have gifts that are meant to help, to encourage you and to admonish you and to exhort you. You're nothing like what you used to be. Supposedly. But are we like Paul, prisoners of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you one of those people who are still trying to make Jesus Lord of your life? Instead of receiving him as Savior and Lord? When you signed up on this deal? See, we don't, we don't help people to count the cost before they try to build this Christian life. We don't have people to count the cost before they realize you're going to war 
against someone who is warring against God. Someone who rebelled in the very presence of God and was cast out of heaven now has become your enemy because he's your father's enemy. And his children have become your enemy because their father's enemy is their enemy. We don't understand the supernatural nature of this thing. Because we just go on to church. We go into the holy huddle. Breaking huddle and have no idea how to live and run down the field and score touchdowns for God. And we really don't care. Because many of us have traded in our uniform where we're supposed to be on the field for regular clothes so we can sit up and stand and watch. That's not the Christian life to the stands. The Christian life is being on the battlefield. And it is a battlefield. Paul understood that as the prisoner of the Lord. I'm a prisoner because of the Lord I follow and I serve. I'm not in this situation because I'm only human. I'm not in this situation because of my heritage. I'm not in this situation because of my ethnic makeup. I'm not in this situation because of where I came from. I'm in this situation because of the Lord. And I surmise tonight that most people aren't getting help from God because they're not on the agenda that God will only give the help for. With all lowliness, we talked about this, and this was our second principle, the principle of, model, of the model of unity through the church, verse 2 and 3. With all lowliness, see, you've got to have the right attitude. Right attitude. The principle of lowliness, we talked about that, you can go listen to the message, we describe what that all means. It means humility. I don't know whether you know or not, but you live in a country where there is very little humility. We don't teach humility. We teach pride. We number one. We number one. We number one. Until some airplanes run into a building and we don't know what we are. Now we want to talk to God. Now we're one nation under God. Everybody come together and sing Kumbaya. But as soon as everything gets peaceful again, we go back to our little cubby holes of segregation. Don't mention God. Don't talk about God. God will call on you when we're ready for it. Read your Old Testament, see how that went for nations in the Old Testament. <laughs> see how that went for Israel when they decided to set God to the side. Build golden calves. Put other gods on the same mantle piece with God. But we don't know our Old Testament, so we don't know about our history. Israel's history is our history, too, as the people of God. Even though the church and Israel are two separate entities, it's a part of our history. But he says, with lowliness, and gentleness, that means meekness. That means mean weakness, that means power under control. See, we're so scared of people running over us. Yes. Yes. Jesus was meek and people ran over him, but he knew who he was, so he didn't worry about it. See, when you know in the end you win, <laughs> people can do whatever they want to. Put you in jail, beat you, Drag you off the courts and trump, bring false trumped up charges against you that aren't even true. Violate the whole legal system. Bring you before the Roman governors and try to get them because they don't want to do the dirty work. And when you meet like Jesus, you can be cool with the people. Because you know there's a resurrection morning coming. I like Jesus. Jesus said, 
Amen. Don't nobody take my life. I lay it down. I pick it back up. Amen. Do you believe that about your life? Mm -hmm. Do you know you can't die and you just transfer? Mm -hmm. The worst thing they can do is kill you, and the best thing they can do for you is kill you. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But you ain't ready to go to heaven no time soon. So I don't want to put my life on the line like that because I ain't trying to speed up this thing. So that's why we don't witness. That's why we don't share the gospel in hostile territory. But there are brothers and sisters all over the world who are doing that and dying. And I always wonder, do we have a different brand of Christianity than they have? Well, they got something we don't got over. Mm -hmm. God likes them kids better than like us kids over here. <laughs> Is God playing a favorite with his kids? No, he's not. They do have something we don't have. Supernatural spiritual enablement. They understand what life really is all about. They are devoted to the king and they are devoted to the agenda of the king. We try to have this and that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Welcome to America. Welcome to the American church. The principle of long suffering. We don't suffer long for nothing. We're not good at long suffering. And we love our kids, don't we? We, we want them to have the best of everything. We want to have it as quickly as possible. We don't want them to ever have no pain, no sorrow. We don't want them to ever have to go through any of the things that we went through. I got a solution for them. Let them die. They don't have to deal with any of them. But if they keep on living, they got to deal with it. You need to teach them how to deal with it from a biblical perspective. In this world, you will have tribulation, Jesus said. You can't be living in a world full of sinners who love themselves first, who love themselves more than they love God, and think they're going to treat you right. And the occupation they have or the position that they hold or the title that they hold, or the uniform they wear, doesn't change what's in their hearts. If you can be saved by clothes, what did Jesus go for? If you can be saved by a title, why did Jesus need to come? If you can be saved because you hold a political position and political power, why did Jesus need to come? If that's what transforms your life, why do you need the Holy Spirit? The church is off base in America. And the problem is, is that we're transporting this cargo of a false Christ and a false gospel to other nations. And we're going to have to answer for that one. God will judge the American church for that time. If not soon, very soon. This leads us to our lesson tonight. That was all introduction and review to bring you up to date. We won't spend a lot of time on these principles. I think they're fairly clear. We want to talk about tonight the practice of the model of unity through the church. We've talked about the priority. We've talked about the principles. What's the practice to look like? See, if we practice these principles I'm going to share with you tonight, there's seven of them, then we will be preserving the unity we already have. Let's look at them. Practice number one. The practice of being connected by one spirit. The word one is the popular word in this context. Look with me, if you will, at verse four. He says in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So we already have unity. We are to endeavor to keep it in the bond of peace. 
In verse 4, he says, there is one body. The church. There's one body. And we're connected by one spirit. The body is the body of Christ, right? The universal body is one. Believers of all times, of all ethnic groups, from all cultures, every tribe, every tongue, every kindred. We see that in Revelation chapter 5 and Revelation chapter 7. We'll gather around the throne and we'll sing one new song and it'll be about Jesus. It won't be about us. One body. This is what Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 20 and following. That they will be one as we are one. Father. The Father and Son are different in their roles, but they're one in essence. The body of Christ, the church, is one in essence. The universal church. The local earthly church can be messed up. The universal church is not supposed to be messed up. And will not be messed up. But understand, the local church, the church that you can see, is to be a reflection of the church you can't see, the universal body. See, the unbelievers have to see something. They don't see the universal church in heaven. So the prayer's got to be about the church on earth. Believers on earth. Christians on earth. They will know you sent me when they reflect the oneness of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They don't see that in heaven. They're supposed to see it on earth. In the body of Christ, the church. With all of our flaws, with all of our mess up, with all of our marring of sin, they're still supposed to see what? The oneness of the Trinity. He says in Ephesians 1, 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We've seen this in Colossians on Sunday, haven't we? He is the head of the church. He is the creator. He is the firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn of creation. He's all that and more. The second practice of the model of unity through the church, the practice of being controlled by one spirit. Let me tell you something. Can I, can I share something with you? You may have never heard this. You may not even know this. You can tell everybody you got it here tonight. Everybody has access to the same Holy Spirit. Everybody's indwelt by the same Holy Spirit. No one is indwelt with more Holy Spirit than anybody else. He didn't give you a literal dose and give me a bigger dose. This ain't Pfizer and this ain't Johnson & Johnson vaccines. You all and believers all around the world are indwelt with the same Holy Spirit. Now the problem is we are not all allowing the Holy Spirit to reign and rule on the same level. So the problem is that you don't, it's not that you don't have access to the Holy Spirit. The problem is the Holy Spirit may not have access to you. Amen. That's where the ruling and reigning come in. The indwelling is done by God. We have nothing to do with that. Amen. The day you got born again, the day that you were chosen, the day that you got saved, the Holy Spirit came and took up residence in you. And he took up residence in you and then you, 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 and you, and you, just like he did everybody else. He didn't say, oh, y'all a little bit darker than the other person, so I got to give you less and give them more. It was not based on your ethnic makeup. It was not based on your culture. It was not based on where you were born. It wasn't based on the fact whether you had a mom and daddy or didn't have a mom and daddy. It's totally based on what? Salvation and being chosen by God through faith in Jesus Christ. We got to stop this divisive mess in the church. We got too much unifying us to be divided. Now, you do have an enemy that will come in and whisper strange things. Who will send false teachers among you 
that Paul warned the Ephesians elders about in Acts chapter 20 who are coming in not to promote what God wants to promote, but to lead disciples after themselves. But the problem is, we don't have enough discernment to know who's who. And so we get duped. Now some of us get duped because we want to be duped. Some of us get duped because we're not growing. You're a mustard seed and you refuse to be a mustard tree. You refuse to grow. You do know you can stunt your own growth, right? Um, yes. Sin stunts your growth. Yes, Amen. Following man-devised philosophies and ideologies and man-made traditions will stunt your growth. Yes. You can only grow on the pure milk of the word. You can only grow on the meat of the word. Okay. Well, Pastor, I, I eat the word every Sunday when you preach it. Yeah, but I see you spit it out in the pee while I'm preaching it. That's how you read my heart. No, I have to read your heart. I see your face. Right. I see your body language. Amen. I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm rolling all up the back of the head, the neck twitching. <laughs> so, Tell the truth. <laughs> Slobber running all down your mouth. <laughs> Some of y'all got upset the one Sunday when the lady was shouting. <laughs> God just kind of pricked my heart and said, at least they ain't sleeping. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> so I ain't had no problem, God. Right. Ain't nobody sleeping. <laughs> the people who normally sleep ain't sleeping this morning. Amen. People who mind be wondering, they paying attention. <laughs> she won't let them nod. She won't let them drift. I said, go ahead, God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the practice of being controlled by one spirit. Galatians 5, 22 says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 says, there are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. <clears throat> so you have a unifying spirit that can bring about diversity among God's people. So why are we dividing over the diversity when we have the unity of the spirit? Now some of us got a spirit, it's just not the Holy Spirit. Hmm. People run around, I just don't feel it in my spirit. How do you not feel what the Holy Spirit inspired and now the Holy Spirit is illuminated in your spirit? Right. The only way that can happen is because you got a different spirit than the Holy Spirit. Amen. This ain't brain surgery. Since the Holy Spirit inspired the text, since the Holy Spirit illuminates the text, and if you got the Holy Spirit in you because he indwells you, how y'all doing something different and thinking something different? Mm -hmm. Now your spirit is really your flesh. Because Adam killed the spirit that was in you. So it's got to be your flesh, but you don't know the difference between the flesh and the spirit. Mm. That's okay. So why don't you just say, I'm talking out the flesh? <laughs> Instead of blaming the spirit, you don't even have. Wow. <laughs> the natural man cannot understand the God because these things are what? Foolish to them, and these things are what? Spirit you discern. Mm -hmm. Natural man is a fleshy man because he don't have the spirit of God residing in him. And he has not been made alive by the spirit. So if you have not don't have the spirit making you alive and the spirit is not resident in you, how do you get in on what the spirit is saying and has already inspired from the text? You can't. See, that's why most people do a better job of remembering my illustration than what I said about the text. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. 
Because your illustration can get with, your flesh can get with the illustration. But it can't get with the meaning of the text. Yes, sir. Wow. Which I remember from, from pastor's illustration. Pastor's sermon. And most people come up with illustrations. Not the meaning of the text. And illustrations are just meant to illustrate. They're not the meaning of the text. The third practice of the model of unity through the church. And this happens in churches all across the country. Oh, pastor preached this morning. What did he say? I don't know, but it's over good. They didn't think they get any of the meaning of what the man was saying on behalf of God. Thirdly, the practice of being commanded by one Lord. The practice of being commanded by one Lord. There is one body, there is one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord. So there's one hope, there's one calling, salvation. We are all called the same way, and we're all called for the same reason, because we're dead in sins and trespasses, separated from God, alienated from God, haters of God. Colossians talks about that, Ephesians talks about that. Jesus talks about that. And there's one Lord. See, that's why we got more people talking about God and not enough people talking about Jesus. Because we just say God, you can be very generic about God. But when you bring up Jesus, that's very specific. Well, you believe in God, I believe in God, we all serve the same God. Nope. Is your God the Father of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Is Jesus his son? Is he co-equal with his dad? And if you don't agree with that, we are not serving the same God. That's why people are getting fooled by all these new little cults creeping up in the urban community. One of the books I'm reading now talks about that whole chapter about uh, the, the Hebrews and the black Hebrews and and kismets and all this other yikki yak junk. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't want to follow the white man's religion and then Satan says, well, I got something for you. Yeah. That will fit more of your heritage. Yeah. But it's not the same Christ. It's not the Christ who's preeminent. It's not the Christ who's the creator of the visible and the invisible. It's not the Christ who's the firstborn from the dead. It's not the Christ who's the firstborn of the resurrection. It's not the Christ. Amen. But it fits my heritage. It fits my black privilege, my white privilege, my Korean privilege, my Asian privilege. Which only gives you a privilege to bust hell while I'm. But we live for this world. Yeah. We're not living for the world to come. Amen. When you live for the world to come, it affects how you live in this world. Mm -hmm. But most people sitting in churches have no concern or concept of the world to come. Amen. Let's look at this Jesus who is Lord. Philippians chapter 2. Turn there with me if you will. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 9 and 11. Let me back up to verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Now I don't know how much plainer that can be. He's equal with God, but made himself. Did you, did you see that? He's equal with God, but he made himself. He voluntarily what? Stepped back. Humbled himself. But made himself with no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. And that's not even the right word. It really should be slave. He took the lowest position known to man. 
and coming in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of a, as a man, he humbled himself. And that's that phrase, lowliness, back in Ephesians. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, of those in heaven, and of those on the earth, and of those under the earth. That, that's everything. Everybody. Yeah, don't even say it. Everybody. And everything. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Savior. Christ is Lord. That Jesus is Lord. Lord. Why do you confess that Jesus is Lord? Because he's Lord. Well, isn't he Lord when I understand he's Lord? No, nope, he was Lord before you understood. Amen. If you never understood, he still would be Lord. And this is to the glory of God the Father. What brings God glory, or one of the aspects of bringing God glory, or one of the ways you can ascribe glory to God, is by recognizing who Jesus is. He's Lord. The question is, is he Lord of your life and my life? Is he Lord of this church? See, I can't speak for any other church. I'm the pastor of this church. It's my responsibility to make sure that Jesus is respected as Lord up in here, up in here, up in here. It's my job to make sure that you're respecting Jesus as Lord. But do you know people don't want pastors in their life like that? You, my shepherd, just be on call. Amen. I'll call you. You don't call us. <laughs> we'll hold you accountable, but don't you hold us accountable. We'll tell you, but don't you be telling us. That's, that's people's mentality. In the church in America, that's people's mentality about their past. Well, we have one day of the year for you. We call it Pastor Anniversary when we want. <laughs> but, see, I understand if Jesus is not Lord, then I can't fulfill my role in your life. Because the only reason you should do anything I say is because I'm telling you what he says. I'm advising you on what he says. I'm guiding you by what he says. But if he's not Lord of your life, then you're not going to respond to those who are trying to guide you based on what he says. Well, I don't agree. This ain't a survey. Well, I don't understand it the way you do. That don't mean it ain't right. And I say that all humility. We can't be wrong as pastors because we're flawed too. As long as the pastor is doing his best to share what the text means by what it says, you ought to make it easy for him. Sheep's supposed to follow him. When sheep get rebellious, you need to break a leg. <laughs> Put them up over your shoulder, carry them around for a while, let them become dependent upon you. When you set them back down, they act like they got some sense. <laughs> When that's done in the Bible, that's done in the, in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament time, that sheep stays right there by that shepherd. <laughs> now, the only one you should really depend on like that is, is Jesus. I'm just his rep. Right. Right. Pastor Strong's his rep. Any pastor is representative. He's the chief shepherd. And we're shepherds that work for him. You're his flock ultimately. But he's delegated flock to different shepherds. You can't be disrespecting one God delegated authority to to watch over your life and then think you right with Jesus. Read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 13 if you don't believe me. Obey those who have, for they watch out for your. And they're going to have to do what? Give an account. Why you let them do what they want to do when you know I said something different? 
Jesus, don't you understand? They're human beings. They're Americans. You know how them Americans are. <laughs> they pull out the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights on you. But I called you. I signed them to you. If they bite you, jump on you, and put you in jail, you still tell them what I told you to tell them. You still got them according to how I told you to got them. I'll deal with them when they get up here. Matter of fact, I've been dealing with some of them before they get up here. They've been blaming the devil and don't know it's me. Because they don't know me. Because I've never been Lord over their life. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you, you, you can't get saved if you don't confess the Lord. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 14, 9, 8 and 9 says, for if we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. How many times you got to say it? If I live, I live for the Lord. If I die, I die for the Lord. It's all about the Lord. Because there's only one Lord. Do you all know Satan is not Lord? We don't even have our theology right. If, if I were to do a word association game with you, most of us would mess it up. You won't mess it up now because I told you you would mess it up. But if I had not told you, you would have messed it up. I would say, God. Y'all would say, Satan. No, God is Satan, not evil. See, a lot of people think Satan is on the same level as God. God is not a created being, Satan is. God is all powerful, he's omniscient, he's every, all present, every word present, Satan is not. So they are not evil. But because we got jacked up theology, we equate Satan on the same level with God. That's how you get yourself on the same level with God. Because if you put something else on the same level with God, you have no problem putting yourself on the same level with God. So now you make life all about you. You're happy. I am happy. What's that got to do with anything? If he's Lord, what does your happiness have to do with anything? And see, this doesn't work for us in a democratic society because we think we get to vote on everything. I vote you in. I vote you out. And then we bring that to church. I'll vote Jesus in and Lord today, but by the time I leave here, if I don't like it, I'm going to vote him out. The next Sunday, I'll vote him back in. And if he's really nice to me this week, I might vote him in on Wednesday. The rest of the time, we live our lives like Jesus is not Lord. And that's why we have all this divisiveness among God's people. That's why we're marching to the tune of the world to get things done, because we don't have no faith in the Lord of the universe. Fourthly, the practice of being consumed by one faith. The practice of being consumed by one faith. Are you consumed by one faith? The faith that saved you? That body of truth that saved you? It, 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 are, are you consumed by that body of truth that saved you? And I won't spend a lot of time on that because we're going to deal with that Sunday in the message and we'll deal with it more then. But the same faith that saved you is the faith that keeps you walking right after you're saved. The same body of truth that saved you is the same body of truth that should be sanctifying you. And there's only one faith, faith in Christ Jesus. Faith in the person and work of Jesus. Faith in what God said. Faith in the promises, faith in the person, faith in the works, faith in the, in, in the history, faith in the track record of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Holy Word. Is that where your faith is? Is your faith in your circumstances, your situations, your 
relationships, your marriage, your children, your job, your whoever's in the political White House office or whatever. <clears throat> There's not many bodies of truth that a person can be saved by. There's only one body of truth that a person can be saved by. And that same body of truth that saves you is that same body of truth that sanctifies you. And it's that same body of truth that will preserve you while you're on your way to heaven. Listen to Colossians 1.23. You should remember this. If indeed you continue in the faith. People get started, but they don't continue. And this doesn't work if you don't continue. If you can indeed continue to faith, grounded. Not only do you get, you've got to be grounded in it, rooted in it, you're going to find out something. you got strong roots in the faith, in the truth about Christ. Are you steadfast because you're grounded? No matter what winds blow, no matter what false doctrine comes your way, no matter what false philosophy and ideology blown your way, you're so grounded and rooted you can't be moved. This is what he's talking about. But today we go with the new thing. The new fad. The new state snake oil handler. The latest entertainment attraction in the church. Well, I can tell y'all some stuff that's going to church y'all ain't going about. Pastors coming in on a zip line to the pulpit from the balcony. Bringing the half-dressed naked cowboy who sings in New York with a guitar on the stage. Back in the 70s and 80s, you brought bodybuilders on the stage and they break bricks like that's going to save somebody. Do magnificent feet of strength. Go to all these concerts where people sing songs that ain't got nothing to do with God. And then you find out they're living lies, don't let me match up with what they sing. But we're blown by various winds of doctrines and styles and personalities and you feel in the blank. Because we're not rooted, we're not rooted, we're not grounded, and we're not steadfast in the faith. Next, the practice of being consummated by one baptism. There's only one baptism. Romans talks about that in Romans 6, 3 to 4. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, that's the one baptism. Listen, if you've been baptized into Christ and another person been baptized into Christ, why are we dividing over what the world's dividing over? How is a person who's been baptized in Christ accountable for the sins of their forefathers? When all your sins have been nailed to Calvary, have you been baptized into Christ? Maybe the problem is Romans chapter 6, verse 3. You don't know. Or do you not know that many of us were baptized in Christ, were baptized to his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Amen. You are not what you were before you were baptized into Christ. You got more available to you than you ever had available to you when you were not in Christ. Amen. This new life is not just when you get to heaven. This new life is for the nasty here and now. Eternal life begins the day you get saved. Eternal life is not a, long, a length of life or a longevity of life. It's a quality of life. That's what eternal life is. You have a new quality of life. Galatians 3.27, for as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. If you were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. You're clothed in him. 
He's going to talk about that. He talks about that in Ephesians. He talks about that in Colossians. We'll get there in Colossians. When you put off the old and you put on the new. The old is not Christ. The new is Christ. And it deals with behavior. It deals with attitudes. It deals with what you love and what you don't love. It deals with who you love and who you don't love. First Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. You didn't put yourself in the church. The spirit birthed you into the church. The spirit didn't say, mm, see, they got some special skills that I really think the kingdom could use. I think we'll choose them and not choose them. It had nothing to do with you. That's why he was preaching and teaching to the Corinthian church. Nobody should be getting the big head about the gift they got because you didn't have anything to do with it. And your gift does not make you saved. Your gift will not help you with obedience one iota. The gift doesn't make you better than anybody else. It just makes you different. But the Corinthian church thought certain gifts were superior to other gifts. Paul comes along and says, you know, it's really the gift that are most valuable to the body are the ones you don't see. <laughs> you can live without a hand. You can't live without a heart. You can live without a foot, but you can't live without your limbs. The most important parts of the body are the ones you can't see. That's humbling for pastors because we see, y'all see us all the time. Guess what the Bible said? You ain't that important. <laughs> you are not the most valuable. You are a gift, but don't get the big. You think it was your preaching, your gifts that was holding the church together. It was that little old lady that's been praying for you all these years that you didn't even know was praying that nobody ever saw. And I was blessing her in spite of you. Because it's the hidden parts. He says it can be the most valuable. And I know the most valuable. That'll humble you. If you are able to be humble. We got too much pride in the leadership of churches. He says, by one spirit we are all baptized in one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slaves or free. All have been made to drink into one spirit. The spirit is not a racist. And if the spirit is not a racist, it's the same spirit that resides in you. What you do in being something that the Spirit is not. If the Spirit is ruling and reigning over you. <coughs> See, there are solutions to this. I didn't have to march and go pick it to get that. If we would just do what the Bible says and live how the Bible says we're supposed to live, we could solve and give solutions to a lot of these issues that are ills in our culture. But it makes too much sense to do it that way. The practice of being chosen by one God. That's what he said. We've been chosen by one God, verse 6. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. We've been chosen, but finally, the practice of being conceived by one Father. We were all birthed by one Father through the Holy Spirit because of faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 Yet for us there is one God and the Father of whom all things and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom all things and through him we live. Aren't, aren't you excited about being God's child? Yes. Yes. See that's good news for the person who don't have a father. You got a father. Yes. That's good news for the person who didn't have a good father. You got a father that is good, yes. who is righteous, who is just. But if you are a father, this is your model of what fatherhood should look like. God the Father is the model of fatherhood for all his children. Yeah, we got men claiming to be Christians. 
who don't look like the father that conceived them and the God who chose them. And we wonder why we have no answers, no examples, no solutions to the ills of our cultures. Because in one place there should be unity. Not because we make the unity, because God has made the unity for us. And we are to endeavor, we are to give everything we got to what? Preserve the unity that Christ brought about, that the Holy Spirit maintains, and that the Father oversees. And only through the church, not through the culture, not through the White House, only through the church, and the homes of those who are part of the church and part of the Christ's body can really give the example of true biblical unity. Because it's not by what we're able to do. It's because of what Christ has done. It's because of what the Father had planned that Christ carried out. And it's because of what the Holy Spirit is preserving as we live our lives by his power and his strength. Amen? Amen? Father, we just thank you so much for this opportunity and this privilege to share these truths with your people. We pray, Father, that it has been a nourishment to our soul, to our minds, and to our bodies. Let's each examine our own selves and see where we are in line with these principles or where we have been violating those principles. And may we be quick to confess, to repent, to turn, and to do so that we can be what you have chosen us and called us to be. It's only by what you provide that any of this is possible. And we give thanks to you for being so gracious and so good and for choosing us, because we did not choose you first, you chose us first. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And thank you for all the faithful churches that are striving to model what we should model. And to be an answer to the prayer that Christ prayed in John 17, verse 20 and following, that he died, was buried, and rose again, to make possible and that he sent the Holy Spirit to enable, to equip, and to empower us to do it. These things we pray in Jesus' wonderful name and heart said, Amen.